everyone. Welcome to our podcast, Voices of Customer Experience. I'm your host, Crystal Garrett, and co-hosting with me today is the CEO of Worthix, Guilherme Secura, or we call him Guy for short. Our special guest today is an award-winning teacher and researcher in the field of consumer psychology. Dr. Ryan Hamilton is the Assistant Professor of Marketing at Emory University's Goizeta Business School and the co-author of The Intuitive Customer. His research investigates shopper decision-making, how brands, prices, and choice architecture influence decision-making at the point of purchase. His findings have been published in some of the most prestigious peer-reviewed journals in marketing and management. He's also found an audience in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Time, USA Today, the Financial Times, and CNN Headline News. Dr. Ryan Hamilton. So Ryan, um, we did some research on you and we found something that we thought was very fascinating. But before I tell you what that is, when we talked to uh, Joe Pine, we asked him, you know, what a young person should do starting from scratch, which, which academic path should they take to become, you know, uh, I guess a voice in, in customer experience. And we couldn't believe his answer. It was a very, very unique answer. He said, they should take theater, theater classes because they learn theme and they learn story and they learn character. They learn how to stage things. And I thought that was, this really cool because I, it's unpredictable. So when I read about you and I saw that you dabbled in stand up comedy, I thought it was really cool. <laughs> so I said, I have to ask Ryan how he went from stand up comedy to PhD. Yeah. Well, it always makes me nervous when somebody says they've been doing research on me. There's no telling what, what direction that goes. From there. Um, <laughs> I guess th this was about as well as that could have gone. Um, <laughs> I did. Yeah. So I, um, I guess I was, I was a professional comedian in the strictest sense and that I made a little money doing it, but I, I don't want to mislead anybody. I was never, I never supported myself doing stand up. It was more of a, a oh, hobby sure. that I did in, in college. Um, the, the, that was, I think it got me interested in, in kind of communication and um, it's certainly been a useful skill as a teacher um, after you've listened to the silence coming back at you from a bar full of angry people um, <laughs> who don't think you're funny. There's, there's nothing in a, a room full of MBAs can do that can scare you at all. That's it's, right. Uh, made so teaching funny. easier. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in terms of the path to a PhD, I, my undergrad was actually in physics. Uh, and so I, I worked for a while doing some rather technical things, and, and it was after working for a few years that I, I realized that what was really interesting to me and what got me excited was um, human decision making and figuring out um, you know, why people chose to behave the way that they did and, and how they evaluated the experiences that they had. And, um, and so that's what led me to a PhD in marketing. It, it's not a very succinct backstory. Um, I, I need to come up with a better version of that story so that people go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And so, yeah, that, <laughs> Give me any confidence in your yeah. <laughs> abilities at all. <laughs> yeah, but but it, it kind of makes sense. I don't know. I, yeah. I guess there's good. No such, good. I, guess, I appreciate uh, your generosity on that. You're a good yeah, man. Yeah. I guess there's there's no such a thing as a right path. No, no. There's no. just the path. That's right. I mean, yeah. I, I will say one thing that I have enjoyed about working in in um, marketing and especially academic marketing is there there are a lot of diverse opinions. So, um, you know, we've we have people from anthropology and sociology and psychology and economics and statistics. Essentially, everybody's got something to say. And so if you're willing to actually listen to multiple points of view, it can be a real rich experience. Now, theater, I've never, I've never heard before, but I think that's great, too. Yeah, so, so it makes sense, I guess, that uh, Joe Pine was right on spot, at least considering your career. You started with... That's right. <laughs> That's life. That's right. life to get stand-up comedy. Exactly, exactly. So, so let's go to the customer experience now. So, uh, you say that customers decide emotionally and and justify rationally. Can you tell us a little bit about that and give some examples of companies that are being successful by understanding this decision-making process between deciding emotionally and justifying it rationally? Sure. So uh, we didn't coin that phrase. Um, uh, it was a phrase in, in the book that, that we wrote, but it was, um, it's kind of a, a standard way of understanding people. And it, there, there's a fundamental truth that underlies it. I think there's some real wisdom underneath that saying. Um, the idea is it, that drives that saying is that 
people don't always know why they're behaving the way that they do. And if you press them on it, it's not always clear that the answer they're giving you is, is what was really driving their decisions at the point they were making them. And what, how much of it is just a story that they tell themselves afterwards. And so um, there's this belief that the things that really motivate us are, are non-conscious, are emotional, are uh, attentional and effective. And then the, the rational decision-making that, um, that we tell market researchers, that we tell ourselves, is kind of this post hoc explanation um, that, that we, we construct this story afterwards. So in, in terms of companies that have, have done this well, I mean, I, I think that companies that, that emphasize some of the, and I use the term cautiously here, but some of the less rational um, aspect of a decision, uh, you know, Disney is one of my go-to examples for a great customer experience. And we took our kids to Disney last year at, at about this time. And, um, you know, it just every aspect of the experience is optimized to create the sense of wonder and, and um, kind of joy and, and surprise. And a lot of those things are not based on kind of a very rational, hard nose. Uh -huh. Let's talk to the customer and what is it that they would want um, it's it's more tapping into these kind of emotional responses that people have uh, as a part of that experience. And some of that can be difficult to kind of get at using traditional market research or asking yeah. very, very specific questions about price and, and trade-offs and quality and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, so th that's I, what we mean by that. I, I totally agree. Like I'm a market researcher myself and that's where I started my career. And it's very curious when you start uh, studying uh, the correlation between the things that the customer says in a questionnaire and how they actually behave. And it's amazing mm. how very often it's totally different. Yep. And, and then you have to use regressions and different models or, or sometimes a, a different qualitative approaches to try to actually get access to the, what's, what's truly driving the decision. So... I, I totally, totally agree with you. And the reason why actually we yeah. created Worthix was a lot because of that as well. It's tricky because even when people are not trying to lie to you, sometimes they just genuinely don't know. And they that's don't know. disturbing. Exactly. People, want, people want to believe they understand their own behavior. And so they're motivated to make sense of it. Even if, even if you're dealing with somebody who's got the best of intentions, they just may not know what's really driving their yeah. decision. And, and the thing is, you're right. Like they don't know. Sometimes we, we I said it for a while brand identification and social proof. And when you actually engage in conversations mm -hmm. with customers about brand and, and how do, we, do they identify with the brand and why, or even about social proof, like how other yeah. decisions are influencing them as well. In the end, they start talking about quality. They start talking about, they, they start yeah. talking about rational yep. things because they cannot explain. They agree that it's influencing them and we can measure yep mathematically speaking that it's influencing them but they cannot explain why so it's yeah it's really really I mean, interesting. It's, so, it's so true it's social proof is, is a great example so I, your listeners may already know but in case they don't um social proof is the idea that we're influenced by the decisions of others that we tend to conform to what other people mm -hmm. do and exactly. and it's, it's a great example uh, you know that a lot of times if you ask people oh well were you influenced by the fact that your neighbor had chosen to do this they'll say no that's crazy there's no way that, that <laughs> <influenced me." Right. laughs> but empirically it does and it's a really powerful motivator but it's it's often a hidden one great yeah. example and that's that's part of the nature of customers irrationality right as you guys say in your book yeah you're listening to voices of customer experience if you want more CX content, visit us at worthix.com to download one of our customer experience ebooks, subscribe to our blog, and get our newsletter on the future of CX delivered to your inbox. When talking about the nature of customers' irrationality, I loved when you guys mentioned baby food and, and how parents hold it, the baby food as if, if they were fruits. They even try to smell, smell it, it, you know, yeah. sometimes. And... Um, uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, prior to, to, to recording this podcast, I have two kids and I must confess, I saw myself doing that with baby food like <laughs> several times. And, uh, <laughs> and, and my question is when you don't have either budget or the time to hire researchers 
how do you tap into this irrationality to improve your customer experiences yeah. and actually cause and influence their decisions? Uh, like what CX executives could be doing immediately after this podcast to tap into this irrationality and improve customer experiences? It's such a good question um, because, you know, the, sometimes we don't have the budgets or the time um, to, to, you know, field a, a real expensive survey. There's some, certain markets where it's just not practical to do that. And there's this idea among some managers that, oh, well, if, if we're not dealing with a fully rational customer, then we might as well just throw our hands up in the air and, you know, there's no way we can predict anything. It's just if, if they're not rational, then they're impossible. Yes. And, and how can we do it? And I don't think that's right. And I, I suspect you don't agree with that viewpoint either. Mm -hmm. um, so the baby food example is, is a really interesting one. I, I heard this example from uh, John Sherry, who's a marketing professor and now at, at the University of Notre Dame. And John does qualitative research. Um, and so this insight was had by people uh, just observing parents in the grocery aisle as they were buying baby food. And, and so the example that yeah. like you referenced it, people, when they picked up a jar of baby food, they would almost treat it as if it were a fruit. So they would squeeze it and they would uh, lift it up to their nose and try to yeah. smell it, smell the jar uh, and try to look past yeah. the label. Even that, that example is derived not from some multimillion dollar bit of survey research. Instead, it was from somebody just observing. And again, if you would ask those parents what they cared about in baby food, they would have given you all the rational answers. What well, we care about quality, sure. we care about preservatives. Exactly. And in, instead, what was really motivating the behavior, unbeknownst to them even, was does this jar feel organic? Does it feel <laughs> natural? Yeah. Does the shape of the glass remind me of a fruit exactly. uh, as opposed sure. to some industrial cylinder? So yeah, are you observing your customers? Are you trying to experience the, the product or service as your customers experience it. Um, you know, can you go and talk to friends and neighbors and have them go through and, and kind of be your secret shoppers uh, and just try to give you a real honest assessment of what the experience looked like for them? Are, you know, are you, are you listening to your customer feedback surveys? Uh, a lot of times firms are sitting on data that they're not using yeah, um, that their customers are providing them for free. Are you listening to those customer complaints? And again, you know, as we mentioned, mm -hmm. it may or may not be that customers are telling you exactly what's driving their decision making in those surveys, but um, it's something. You know, can you something? Can yeah, you, yeah. Can you get something? Yes. Yeah, can you it, start? It, I, I always say this as well. Like it's something like so it's a place for you to start, and then you can develop yeah. other studies to deep dive and and maybe observe. Uh, or maybe call customers and uh, and uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about intuition and and reason mm -hmm. and decision making. Uh, for me, it was uh, really clear in your book how how it could be done with B two C offers, like combining intuition mm -hmm. and reason to kind of provoke decision making. Uh, so in your book, you mentioned a really good example for B two C, which is uh, the wine example. So you play French music in the wine store and you cause people to buy more French wines. But my question is, mm -hmm. what about more complex decisions when you have several influencers, for example, in real estate, when a couple or a family is, is looking for a house sure. or, or sure. in B2B when you're trying to sell uh, something for uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars or maybe millions of dollars. So how do you, how do you actually provoke intuition and to kind of lead customers to the decision you want? Yeah, it, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, maybe one way to understand the, the role of intuition and decision-making is um, based on this model that, uh, that Kahneman, who I, I think we're going to talk about at some point um, proposed, uh, he, he didn't propose it, but he really got behind it and, and mm -hmm. became a champion of that. And the idea is that we have more than one way of thinking about things. We have kind of a rational or an intuitive way of thinking about it. So if, if you want to anticipate how your customers are going to react to things, you can try to think, is this going to be a more rational or a more intuitive decision for them? And the examples you gave, on average, are probably going to lean more towards the rational side, right? The more effort we put into something, the more important it is, the more people we have involved. So I think that as a general rule, 
yeah, we should anticipate that real estate decisions and, you know, B2B decisions are going to be more rational than maybe choosing a shampoo. But Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a mistake to say that therefore there's no intuitive influence. If you talk to a good real estate agent, they will tell you the importance of uh, baking cookies before they have an open house so that the house is filled with the aroma of fresh baked cookies or uh, vanilla or none of those things are rational. They'll talk to you about the importance of staging a home. Um, None of these things change the rational aspects of the real estate purchase. These are very intuitive influences. It's easier to imagine living in a home if it's full of furniture. The same thing applies for B2B. Like uh, it's my two cents here. Like it's when, when you're trying to sell to an enterprise a product and you're in, and you're not with the right price, like you're charging maybe too low, it somehow yep. influences the other part to think that you're not that good. Uh, yeah. uh, and at the same time, you see companies also try to improve or to increase social proof by putting logos of customers in their website to kind of cause that intuition that that has quality that it's validated Mm -hmm. so so i I guess i guess it's it's maybe more complex absolutely i i think that on average we can think of them as more rational decisions i think that's appropriate and helpful um but don't abandon the the intuitive aspects altogether um even in in b2b decisions there's still these signals that people are looking for there's still things that make them feel more confident that feel better Mm -hmm. And, awesome. and, and one thing, like, kind of in, in summary, summarizing here, like, uh, I guess that in the end, we are talking about people all the time, right? So even though there are yes. several influencers for a real estate uh, uh, decision or, or in a B2B sales process, they are all human beings making decisions and being influenced. At it. So it's basically, even though when you're, even when you're in, a, in a B2B uh, transaction, you should never forget that, that like companies don't sign checks. People do. Yeah, there's this real weird mental acrobatics that they do where, you know, if they're selling in a B2B space, then they treat it as if the, the other firm is completely rational and they, and they care about these rational things. And then you ask them, well, well, the last couple of big purchases that your company made, were those made in a rational way? And they'll laugh at you. They're like, oh, no, I'm kidding. It was, you know, Bob just liked this company better than that one. And that's how they made the decision. So yeah, there's this yeah. acknowledgement that no, no, my company's not rational, but our customers, they're rational. Um, but it's all just people. Okay. <laughs> now let's talk about a, a very different topic, but I guess you're, our, our audience in general and you, you as well, Ryan, you're going to identify yourself, which is menu at restaurant. I hate when I go to a restaurant yeah. and there are too many options and they all look great. That, that makes it even worse. In the yeah. end, of course, I always pick something but there's always that feeling that I might have made the wrong choice. I guess several companies uh, today worked, uh, has, have been working to reduce their offers to better defend them. And if I'm not wrong, even Apple, like Steve Jobs after returning to Apple, this was one of his first movements was to uh, reduce and simplify their product portfolio. So my question to you is, do you believe that in general, less is more and, and why? Um, this is actually a topic that I've done a little bit of um, research on. We've published some peer review papers on this. Uh, there will be lots of exceptions to this rule, uh, but as a general rule, it is surprisingly easy to overwhelm your customers with choice. That's this is another one of those counterintuitive findings because if you ask your customers, they will tell you more is better. Give me more choice. Give me more options. That's what I want. Um, but over and over again, we found in these uh, instances where it's been studied that people can easily become overwhelmed and become less satisfied with their choices. They can actually be more likely to not make a decision. I mean, we've all experienced this ourselves um, when we scroll through Netflix. We'll try to find something, and if you don't find something within the first you know, 30 seconds that you're looking, then you might end up scrolling through movies for an hour and then not choose anything. It just yes. becomes too overwhelming. Netflix is a great example. I know that they've been putting a lot of effort in, in hyper personalization. Like, uh, since again, I have kids and I'm married, like it's very, it, whenever I turn on my Netflix, I have to pick my user. But the other day I, I picked my wife's user. I don't, I don't remember why. And, uh, and I saw that the movies that Netflix is offering to her is like 
totally different than the movies that are being offered to completely me. Completely different. And uh, yep. we, which, which was kind of an interesting experience, even though like we have almost the same age, they have very good algorithms running behind it, that it's causing this, this sense of hyper personalization. But in the end, I agree with yep. you, even though in her profile, it's sometimes it, it feels that are, there are too many options and you, you feel bad when you pick one because maybe you're picking the wrong one. That's or sometimes how I feel. All. Or you don't choose at all. Or, or you don't choose at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, it, you raise an interesting point here, which is what do you do if you're this retailer? So there are some times where brands or retailers uh, do reduce the assortment size, right? They'll, they'll cut back on the number of brands they sell or the number of uh, the things that they sell in the store. Um, the Coke Freestyle machine is another example that I use. I mean, there's literally hundreds of thousands of different soda combinations that you can use using the Coke Freestyle machine. But they present the options to you in such a way that it's kind of a decision tree. You know, do you want a fruit flavored drink? Do you mm -hmm. want a cola? Do you want a uh, diet? And then from there, you have another set of choices to make. So it's not just here's 400,000 different drink options. What do you want? It, it feels much more yes exactly it feels much more approachable so as a rule consider that you might be overloading your customer and that's a bad thing it, you can try to cut back or if that's not practical is there a way of making it easier um, by giving them what they're more likely to want up front or by by giving them an easier way to search through options or to create something that they want that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, and I guess that, that should be part of the role of a customer experience professional is kind of to have a great understanding yeah. of who they're selling to and say, look, we don't need to come up with all these offers. If we really understand our customers' needs and expectations, we can actually design better products or services that will, will be easier for them to pick. Yes, or, yes, or not, not even easier, like natural, should be, should intuitive. be natural, intuitive, or, or, and even memorable. Yeah, right. yep. I, I think that's a great way of putting it. To hear more from Ryan Hamilton, join him and CX expert Colin Shaw at beyondphilosophy.com and purchase their book, The Intuitive Customer, to learn how customers think. Another thing is uh, we all know that getting someone to change a behavior or a decision is really, really difficult. And that's, yes. that's what most companies are trying to do with customers most of the time. So I guess yes. when a customer experience executive doesn't know the difference between intuition and habits, it gets even harder. So why is mm -hmm. it important to know the difference between habits and intuition in order to better influence uh, your customers to change? Uh, good. So this is, a, I mean, this is a tough one to to answer. I, th I think that the the fundamental way that you succeed uh, as a marketer, as a customer experience um, manager, is understanding what is driving your customers' decisions. If you don't understand that, then you're really just throwing darts in the dark um, and hoping something yeah. hits. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way I would look at this is that sometimes your customers' decisions, or maybe some of your customers' decisions are driven by intuition. Some of them are driven by habits. Some of them are driven by other things entirely, right? But, but if we're looking specifically at, at habit and intuition, I mean, the differences are, um, these are, are the similarities, I guess, first. Uh, these are both easy ways of making a decision. They're kind of low engagement ways. People don't need to think about them. But they're not the same in that habits are learned behaviors and they're triggered by specific cues. So, um, I've talked to companies that want to like instill a habit, for instance, um, it, in contexts where habits are impossible. So mm -hmm. I talked to a, an insurance company that wanted to instill a habit where every time you would um, like, I don't know, use the, some kind of insurance app that you would have this habit of doing something and you're never going to get a habit it's formed in that way because people are just not going to use the, their insurance app often, often enough to instill a habit. Exactly. You can encourage intuitive behaviors, right? It, it, these are kind of the more natural, the easy things, the things that people are going to be. Uh, it drives me, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I fly Delta because I live in Atlanta um, and the, the Delta app is actually pretty good. I, I like it. But um, 
the, on, on their websites, when you choose the seat that you want to fly, um, the way to exit out of that, that, that seat choosing part of the website mm-hmm. is up in the top right hand corner instead of being in the bottom left, uh, the bottom right hand corner. That is not intuitive. Every time you fill out a form online, yeah. the, the wow. part that says, okay, I'm done. I, I have lived the same experience. Yeah. So, I mean, it, why are you fighting that? If you're the web developer at Delta, like why, why would you fight that intuition that people have? Make it easy for people. Mm-hmm. So th- that's not a, a decision-making intuitive experience, but it does relate to, you know, the experience that I have as a, a Delta customer. And like I say, by and large, I, I think their website's pretty well designed and I enjoy it. But there are a couple of these little things like, why, why, why would you make me go through that? Mm-hmm. Um, so are you looking at these things from that intuitive standpoint? If you want to look at it from a habitual standpoint, that's a, that's a different approach. It's a different way of making decisions. And, and habits is a complicated topic, but real quick, the, the thing you need to care about then is, is what are the cues, the environmental or situational cues that are going to start a habitual behavior? Because that's what, that's what defines habits psychologically, is there's some external cue that your brain picks up on and goes, oh, I know what we're supposed to do here, and starts you down their path towards some behavior. So it might be entering the toothpaste aisle and your brain goes, oh, I know what yeah. we're supposed to do here. Right. We're going to yeah. go right to this part of the shelf and pick that up. That's a habit. Yeah. That's totally. not necessarily the intuitive thing to do. Um, so that, that's the difference there. But does that get at, at the question you were, you were trying to ask there? Yeah, 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 for sure. So, so what you're saying is that it's very easy to misunderstand habits with loyalty behaviors, right? So this is one of my this is one of my pet peeves. This is one of my hobby horses. <laughs> um, I think that in yeah, you're gonna regret asking me this question. Um, <laughs> We're gonna but, look. No, no, come on. <laughs> so I, I think that um, when you look at behavior, when you look at just purchase behavior, for example, it's very difficult to know if somebody's buying from you because they're loyal or because it's it's this uh, inertial habitual behavior. They're both buying from you. So from one standpoint, who cares? That's great. Um, from another standpoint, they, they matter very much because they're different motivations. So if I'm buying from you because I just love your product and I'm loyal to your product, that is a whole set of uh, associations and meanings that go along with that. Yeah. Um, I'm more likely to tell other people about it. I'm more likely to forgive you and, and try to make it better. Um, I, if I move out of a situation, like if I move to a new city and I've got a whole new set of different environmental cues, I'm more likely to seek you out because mm-hmm. I'm loyal and I like that. Um, habitual behavior, none of that is true. Um, habitual behavior, if, if I consider it, if you, if you encourage me to think about it at all, I might reconsider because I haven't even been thinking about it. If, if you do something wrong, that might cause me to reconsider. If I move to a different place, that might, I'm not going to recommend it to anybody because I don't think about it. So right. I think that it's important for people to understand the difference. And some of the things that we do as marketers, as customer experience managers, mm-hmm. to instill habitual behavior or, or repeat purchasing, we will call loyalty programs. Uh-huh. And they are most emphatically not engendering right. loyalty. There's nothing wrong with rewards programs. You know, going back to Delta, I, I fly Delta primarily because of their um, you know, Sky Miles program. Uh, and I, I get a lot out of that as a customer and, and I appreciate it. And, and, and so I continue to buy from them. But that doesn't make me loyal in the sense that That's it right. makes me like So, so we just said it's more of a convenience in that case, right? I, I think that it's, it just adds to the value of the offering. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it changes, it, it's an extrinsic motivator. And there's a lot of research showing that extrinsic motivators can often kill intrinsic motivation. So I maybe like Delta's experience and feel like they treat me well, but then they also are, are bribing me with this rewards program to buy from them. I, as a customer, I can interpret that as, oh, I must not like them that much if they have to bribe me to get to buy from them. Yeah. Right? So they can actually be undermining loyalty. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong for them to do. I don't think it's a mistake. Um, I think that they get a lot of business from their rewards yeah. programs. I do think it's a mistake if they fool themselves into thinking that that is loyalty. So, so the misunderstanding uh, between habits and loyalty, it's, it's probably because habits, they're more related with the convenience or limited availability of options or even laziness, right? Like it's, it's sure. simply there, yep. it's, it's convenient and, and I'm, I'm a recurrent 
customer, but not because I'm loyal, but simply because it's too it's, much to it, swap. Yeah. It's, it's there or, mm -hmm. or it's my only option that, that happens very often with telecommunication companies. Oh, yeah. that, this is a very oh, interesting goodness. conversation. I'm really, really enjoying. Uh, let's talk now about forming memories and how important they are if you're trying to create a profitable experience. So Joe Pine says that experience happens inside customer. And, and Professor Kahneman also addressed memories in his book, which by the way, I loved it, by saying that human beings we, uh, as human beings, we have the experience, experiencing self, which is uh, you when you're, doing, when you're doing something. And we also have the remembering self, which is basically uh, you, when you when you're remembering that thing. So my question is, how companies uh, can be more precise in causing memories while delivering their experiences? Also, can you tell us a case where, where the memory was the great a lie and differential for a company strategy? So there a lot of times that the things that are great about an experience are also going to be the things that form great memories. So there, there's going to be a lot of alignment there. I think where you can get some additional insights and, and uh, Kahneman certainly goes into this in, in his book and, uh, and others have talked about it as well, um, is the differences between um, the, the, the experience and the memory of the experience. So for example, there's something called the, the peak end rule, which is the idea that we don't remember all parts of an experience equally. Instead, uh, what drives our memory formation tends to be the peak, the most intense part, and then the end of the experience. So if you're managing an experience, you want people to remember it well, um, and you have the choice of, of taking an action that'll improve the average experience throughout, or of just improving the best parts uh, or improving the end part of the experience, the mm -hmm. science suggests you should probably focus on that peak and focus on the end because that'll be what really drives uh, the behavior. Um, one example, um, apologize, this is a little gross, but this is the way it was studied by the scientists. They, they actually discovered this or, or found some evidence for this in doctors giving patients colonoscopies, um, which is a very unpleasant experience, I am told. Uh, I haven't had it myself, but... <laughs> they, they actually improved, they improved the experience overall by making the, the end part of the experience less unpleasant. They essentially would, they, they would finish the procedure and then instead of um, just kind of wrapping up and, and finishing it immediately, they would just kind of leave things the way they were for another 30 seconds or minute to, yeah. to give kind of a, a less unpleasant exit for the procedure itself. I'm, I'm trying to phrase this in a way that will <laughs> cause people to not shut off their computers and stop listening to you right now. But that, that was what they did. So they, and it, and it worked. People were more likely to go back and get follow-up care. They were more likely to follow the doctor's instructions. They were more likely to report it was a less unpleasant experience. So by actually making this bad experience longer, but making sure that the very end part of the experience was less bad, yeah. People remembered it as being overall a better experience. Yeah, yeah. And another thing is that reminds me of the theater thing that we were just discussing. That's something you learn. And actually, as, as you also worked with a, as a stand-up comedian, like you always leave the great moment to the end. So you basically, right. you have to choose two or three very strong messages. And I guess that when it comes to experiences, the same thing. You have to choose three, two, one, two or three strong feelings that or memories that you want to create and make sure that probably towards to the end it's when you're delivering so probably at the beginning so you can have a, a nice feeling of welcome and and towards to the end so you can have customers to memorize it so again i guess we're talking again about theater and acting that's and right that's right <laughs> i think it's a great example yeah, yeah you want to finish strong absolutely you want to finish strong that's that's amazing that's amazing now how how do you, Ryan, how do you keep up with the speed of change? And, and what's coming next? What, what are the new... What's next in the horizon? For yeah, what's next in the horizon? What are the, your the projects. forthcoming projects? And how can we find you? Um, so I'm, as my kids will tell you, I'm the last person to go to for something cool uh, and new. <laughs> um, I, I tend to hide out in my office. Um, uh, so I, I try to keep up on what's going on just in part, you know, through 
opportunities like this, talking with folks who are experts in industry and, and then practice. And um, But my area of expertise is in the distinctly uncool basics. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that there are these great new tools and technologies that are constantly being available. And the firms that do it well recognize that these new opportunities are ways of doing the basics better. Um, yes. What worries me is when I see firms that are out there going, oh, this is this new tool. This has got to totally fundamentally change the nature of business. You know, markets are never going to be the same after this. Customers are just going to behave totally differently because they've got this new platform and this new app or this new whatever. And I, that always worries me. I, I think that it, so many times when I talk to customers or when I talk to companies and they're looking for some new insight, very rapidly it turns out that they haven't done the basics. They, they haven't figured out who their customer segments are and uh -huh. what those customers really value. And instead they're just, they're chasing this new app. They're like, oh, well, we need to be on this whatever, you know, social network that didn't exist yeah. six months ago. And not asking the question, well, are your customers there? And do they want you there? And do they, you know, do you understand what's driving? Yeah. So I, I'm going to take the opposite approach to that question and say, um, you know, find out what's, what's cool and new. And, and, you know, and I don't want to downplay this. Sometimes it really does give you completely new opportunities. But mostly make sure you're using this new technology and these new opportunities to um to do the basics better yeah and, and i guess it's it's also because we are we're constantly pushed to try to find magical formulas right we simply forget that usually everything's under our, our own roof like we can study our own customers we can talk to them we can actually the best of the best practices is, is to actually have a better understanding of your customer and start it and start from yeah. there right that that's the most important thing in business in my opinion do you yeah. understand your customer these new tools do they give you a better way to understand your customer great mm -hmm. uh, do they give you an opportunity to talk to people who are, are not actually your customer and in a way that is inconsistent with you know your value proposition well then you shouldn't be there and you're, you're right. wasting your time and people are always people, so even with keeping up with the speed of yeah. change, we're always going to feel, we're always going to have intuition, we're always going to have habits, we're always going to want memories, right. and those things always have to be taken into consideration. Amazing, amazing. So, Ryan, uh, I guess that's it. I, I, I really appreciate your time. That was Thank a lot of fun. Dedicated for this, for our podcast. And we thoroughly enjoyed your book, too, by the way. Yeah, the book, the book was really Thank amazing. Thank you. I recommend people to buy it if you didn't. As the, the intuitive. intuitive customer, seven imperatives for moving your customer experience to the next level uh, by Ryan Hamilton and Colin Shaw. And we, we just uh, spoke with Ryan here. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Thank and, uh, you so much. I really appreciate it. You guys were great. Thank you. And thanks to our listeners. Please join us next week on Voices of Customer Experience to hear from Silicon Valley CEO Emilia Chagas to talk customer centricity and startup culture. Voices of Customer Experience is brought to you by Worthix. This podcast is produced by Crystal Garrett, Mary Drummond, and edited by Anthony Sledge. To hear more and subscribe, go to worthix.com to get more material.